Welcome into the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon. I'm Dave Hellman, and I hope you are enjoying this holiday week wherever you are, whatever you've got going on. Maybe you're listening or watching while you're doing some last minute shopping, wrapping some presents, getting off of work, starting work. If you're starting work, I truly sympathize with you. We'll try to get you through this thing. Either way, hope you're enjoying your holidays. Hope you're getting ready for a banger of a Christmas weekend here. Week 16 in the NFL on deck. Typically, when we do this show, we we go around the league. We We try to hit on as many numerous topics as possible. And I wish I could say we planned this, but sometimes life just works out beautifully that way. We'd already planned to interview this guest heading into the week. And wouldn't you know it, it just became that much better when the Seattle Seahawks jumped onto the league radar on Monday night football, they upset the Philadelphia Eagles as we talked about earlier this week and who better to break it all down than a guy who, who lived that experience, who played for the Seattle Seahawks, who was a pro bowler with the Seahawks, who helped them win their lone Super Bowl championship to date. It's just so serendipitous. We are joined now by none other than former Seahawks linebacker KJ Wright, current Seattle media personality, have a chance to break down all things Seahawks, the big win over Philadelphia, not to mention where things go for Seattle here over the next three weeks. All right, KJ Wright, host of KJ All Day, host of the KJ Wright Show on ESPN Seattle 710 AM, a Seahawks legend. Don't need the introduction, but but we'll give it to you. Uh, <laughs> man, Thank look, you. K, KJ, we, we had you booked to come on before Monday night. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I mean, I was looking forward to it before that game, but then we get one of the games of the season. And I said it, I said it after that game is like, look, I'm not going to compare it to any of the big playoff wins that y'all had, but in recent years, that's gotta be, you know, top of the list in terms of nights in, in Seattle at Lumen field. Listen, listen, I went to the VMAT yesterday. I talked to coaches, athletic trainers, players, they're saying it's right up there with one of the best moments, the most energetic that stadium has been in a really, really long time. And I was there too. I was there Monday night. That place was rocking. It was jumping. Our back against the wall. There's no way we could lose five games in a row. They said we refuse to lose five games in a row. And um, Drew Locke came through in the clutch. One time out left, 92 yards to go. JSN, that place was um, absolutely electric last night or Monday night. It it was it was such a good reminder of what Seattle's home field advantage can be. Um, all right, I, I want to get to Drew Locke, obviously, but the thing I want to talk to you about first is you know, you were you were kind of part of the headlines up in Seattle heading into this game. I was, you know, I'm reading the headlines, I'm paying attention to everything. KJ Wright is is talking about look, this the Seahawks gotta make some lineup changes. This defense is this isn't this isn't sustainable. And lo and behold. Pete Carroll makes a couple changes. Julian Love is playing in the game. They get Michael Jackson into the game, and you see the result. So, I mean, first of all, what was this last week last week like for you? Sort of, you know, like I said, being part of the news cycle. And where do you think this defense goes from here after this big Monday night game? Well, let's just say I got a lot of phone calls and a lot of text messages saying, "Hey." The block is hot. I don't know if you can come around here anymore because I go to practice often, see the guys. But I was pissed off. I was pissed off with four losses in a row and in the fashion that we were losing in, too. And I said, if we come out there and it's the same personnel on the football field on defense, we're not serious about winning. And so it had to get, get corrected. I know Coach Carroll's philosophy is defense wins championships. It's like this person's not tackling well. This person isn't covering well. Have them over there on the sideline. Have them get right, have them learn their playbook better, have them just execute the game plan better. But I was like, you know, I played with a lot of those guys, so they weren't mad. They were mad. They were upset. But at the end of the day, I care about winning. I care about telling the truth that needs to get done. I'm I'm so fascinated by that dynamic. And look, I'm not I'm not asking you to like put anybody on blasts or anything like that. But it's interesting. You know, you I mean, you were a big part of those Legion of Boom defenses. Pete Carroll is still there. John Schneider is still there. I mean, obviously, you, still there. but Bob, Bobby is still there. I saw, you know, Bobby Wagner mentioned in the media last week. He's like, look, KJ is part of the media now. Like, how do you, 
how do you kind of straddle that line of like, look, I, I was part of the brotherhood. I am part of the brotherhood, but like, but I got a job to do now too. I tell people this all the time. I owe a responsibility to the fan base. I got to be honest. I have 11 years of NFL experience. I'm giving you guys the blueprint. I'm giving you guys my ex ex experience and what I lived. I'm not just some guy talking ball. I actually lived this. Jamal Adams, I got benched too. When I played in Seattle, I got benched my last year. I could speak to this. I know what it's like battling injuries. And so there's not too much that you can tell me that, that I haven't been through. And so it's not always fun to say something about my guys and have to see them face to face. DK Metcalf, what happened with him? You guys saw the big fight that happened, right? Uh, when Joe, when Fred Warner pushed him in the back of the head, that was some bull crap. But when it came to that moment where you want to grab his face mask and rip his helmet off, you got to have self-control. You can't do that. That happened to me in Green Bay, Martellus Bennett. I wasn't even looking. He came and just shoved me out of nowhere. I wanted to get up and fight him and scrap. I got to put the team before I want to put my own personal desires. And so that's all I'm saying. Protect the team and handle business that way. So Jamal Adams is obviously, it's the most interesting situation here. He's been an all pro player in his career. He's, he's dealing with an injury. I thought it was interesting. Pete Carroll had a lot to say about just what he's going through to be available. But I mean, clearly the, the play on the field has dipped for whatever reason. And I get that. Where, where do you see that going from here, this, you know, it's, it's this big public story, not to close the chapter or the book on anything, but I mean, how did, how does a player of that caliber bounce back from a moment like this? Well, first um, the injury that he's going through is hard. Let's get it understood. It's really, really hard to come back from this injury. Jimmy Graham went, went through this years ago and he wasn't quite right ever, but he was actually able to get on the football field and move like two years down the line. But with Jamal Adams, what happened in the media, that was unfortunate to see what happened there on Twitter and double down on it in your press conference. But then not showing up to the game. Like I said, this man, the game is bigger than any individual. The game is bigger than ourselves. And if you got to be a cheerleader, if you got to be over there rah rah cheering on your teammates in the midst of your own struggle, in the midst of your own adversity, that's what you got to do. And it's not fun. It's not easy. It's a very tough pill to swallow. I've, I've been there. I've done that. But at the end of the day, you got to support your boys. You got to represent them the best you can and just be there for the team because it's bigger than any individual. I am curious. Yeah, we talked about this before we started recording this. You know, it's the 10th anniversary of, of that Seattle team that won Super Bowl 48. And man, like what a what a team of personalities, like whether you want to talk about Sherm whether you want to talk about Earl Thomas, yourself, Bobby mm -hmm. Wagner, Marshawn Lynch, like all, all those great guys. So I'm, I'm curious between those guys who like know what the standard is in Seattle and the team that's there now, that's, that is going through it. Who yeah. do you, who do you, who do you hear from more when things aren't going well with the Seahawks, like the current guys or the guys who know how good it can be? <laughs> Honestly, it's 50, 50. I, I talked to, I was just yesterday with Doug Baldwin, Cliff Averill, Deshaun Shedd. Um, I talk to Cam Chancel all the time. Like, we talk Seahawks football. We talk about the current state of what's going on now. And I also played with the Bobby Wagner, current player, Quandre Diggs, coaches. My coach is still there. And so I talk to everyone. I was just with Coach Carroll yesterday. And so it's honestly 50-50. And you got to be careful with just, putting your opinion on what's going on now with the current guys because of the sensitivity level. But when I'm with the boys and we're just talking, oh, we let it out. We like this person, <laughs> that person. He could never <laughs> even think about stepping on the football field when we was playing in 2013. And so we have a lot of fun as an older, retired, uh, former guys. But um, I talk to everybody, man. So it's still all love on both sides. All right, so let's spin it forward. Big, I mean, he, it, it's a season-saving win. You know, I think I saw that the the Seahawks playoff odds jumped up to like 50% now that they got this win over the Eagles. They go to face mm -hmm. Tennessee. And uh and the news, I think it came out just a couple hours ago, <laughs> is that uh, you know, Pete Carroll expects Geno Smith back in the starting lineup. Amazing draw job by Drew Locke. Yeah. Where 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 do you see that going from here? I mean, Geno was amazing against Dallas a, a few weeks ago, but obviously dealing with the injury. 
Uh, how do you see that going forward? What do you what do you expect from the quarterback position as the Seahawks try to pull this off? Well, first off, there's a lot of chatter in the town and who should be the starter, who should be the guy. And it's clearly Geno Smith. And all of those losses that we had, we didn't have a single game where we rushed over 100 yards. Kenneth Walker was hurt. Charbonnet came in. We didn't even rush over 100 yards combined on offense. And on the defensive side, the numbers that they were giving up on defense, talking 40 points to Dallas, 230 pieces from the San Francisco 49ers. All right, that's, that's hard to keep up with um, when you're playing offense. And so put Geno back in at the starting quarterback. He is your guy. And he knows I got three games. I got to get 10 wins. Got to get my team to the playoffs. The ball is going to be in your hand. We started with you. We paid you. Coming off a phenomenal season. But we need you to just make sure you pick your game up and finish this season on a high note. Because it has not been fun to watch these last few weeks. But right now we got that breath of fresh air. This three-game skid with three, you know, you got Mason Rudolph. You got um, who's, who's quarterback in Tennessee? Oh, uh, you got Levis, uh, young well, I, I think, yeah, Will Levis Tenn and, yeah, Ryan Tannehill, Tannehill also. And you got Kyler Murray. All winnable games. So take it one game at a time, handle business, and get yourself in a position to make a playoff run. This is something people have talked about for a lot of the season. Like every time, and it's it's been so up and down with Seattle, every time it seems like there's a down stretch, People talk about Geno's future. Well, you know, the, the deal is structured so that the Seahawks can get out of it if they want to. Is it as simple as Seattle getting to the playoffs to, like, commit to this vision of the team, do you think? Or is there more to it than that? There's way more to it than that. I, I do believe that they are, regardless how we finish this season, we finish 0-3 or 3-0, and I truly believe they're going to be looking in the draft to take someone at the quarterback position. I believe they're going to look early, especially with how much talent is in this draft class. But that does not mean that Geno Smith is going to be relieved. That don't mean he's going to be cut. I do believe that you could draft a quarterback first round, have Geno Smith still be the guy next year, groom this young man up, and then he eventually takes over and leads the Seahawks for the next eight to ten years. I do believe that's what they're thinking. And so it's not, it's not saying that Geno Smith is going to get cut after this year. But I do believe regardless in the draft, they're going to look to improve that position. I mean, it's a, it's a good year to do it. There's a boatload of quarterbacks oh, yeah. coming out. There's a, there's quite a talented quarterback right up there in Seattle playing college football mm -hmm. right now, <laughs> if I'm correct. Yep. I can't wait. Trophy winner, but we're, we're, that's another well, thing. I'm see, another you're talking, you're talking to an LSU grad now. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I can go that far. Hell of a season for Michael Penix though. And shoot, man. I mean, I love the way this happens. Like, the Seahawks kind of felt like an afterthought here for a couple of weeks and they beat the birds. Exactly. And now, I mean, they're right back in it. They're as interesting as anybody. I can't wait to see how the last three weeks go. And uh, man, I, I hope we can uh, wrap with you about it when we get closer, man. This was fun. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I'm always here. Appreciate you for having me. Thanks so much again to KJ. Let's get into some news and some headlines from around the NFL. Starting with the big one, Aaron Rodgers is going back to the Jets' active roster, but it's just for practice. It's not that big of a headline. Aaron Rodgers, Jets had already activated his practice window a few weeks ago. Remember, he had like a, a leaping interception, they want to call it, practicing with the Jets. They had to decide, do they elevate him to the active roster? Do they shut him down for the year? Well, they are elevating him to the active roster, but Aaron Rodgers won't be playing in any games this season. He said this week that, quote, being cleared as 100% healed is not realistic at 14 weeks, end quote. I think, I think it's safe to say pretty much everyone in the world knew that, Aaron, but it has become a breathlessly discussed storyline, I guess. Look, I'm culpable in it as well. Right here on this show, we've talked about Aaron Rodgers' potential recovery from Achilles surgery all season long from the time it happened in week one. It's been this hotly, hotly debated story. Aaron Rodgers out to prove everybody wrong that he would be able to come back. He did say he would have pushed to play if the Jets were still alive for the postseason, but they were mathematically eliminated with that loss to Miami on Sunday. I mean, that sounds good in retrospect, but haven't we known for at least six weeks that the New York Jets weren't going to be part of the NFL postseason? So I've got a little more to say about Aaron Rodgers coming up later on the show and the New York Jets for that matter, but uh, he'll, he'll be practicing. He won't be playing. 
good on you, Aaron. You stayed in the news cycle all season long. In a weird way, I guess that's really impressive, but we won't be seeing Aaron Rodgers again this season. The Jets release fullback Nick Bauden to make room for Rodgers on the active roster. That's Eh, that feels like a bummer of of some news to get if you are the the Jets fullback who who got that call this week, the week before Christmas. Elsewhere, the Atlanta Falcons are making a switch at quarterback themselves. Taylor Heineke moving back into the starting lineup. If you'll remember, Desmond Ritter threw just a brutal red zone interception last week in Carolina, helped cost the Falcons that game derailed their playoff hopes majorly. They're not math- mathematically eliminated, but it looks bleak right now for the Falcons to make the postseason. Ritter has 10 touchdowns and 10 interceptions on the season. So it makes sense to try something new, although Atlanta's already tried this. This will be Heineke's third start this season. He's 0-2 in those games. So sometimes you just got to make a change for the sake of, of looking for a spark. Maybe Taylor Heineke can provide that. He did lead the commanders to the postseason back in 2020. He's had, he's had at least a handful of very impressive games, but regardless of who they've started at quarterback, it just hasn't worked out for the Atlanta Falcons this year. Maybe Heineke can harness some of that 2020 magic for them. Sounds like Heineke might need to harness some of that power. If I'm reading these quotes correctly, let's, let's stick with the Falcons for the next headline. Atlanta owner, Arthur blank asked about his head coach, Arthur Smith, whether the Falcons might make a change, whether he's on the hot seat, Arthur blank said, let the season play out and go from there, which I mean, maybe you just want to see how it finishes, what happens before you make any rash statements. But again, the, the loss to Carolina dropped the Falcons playoff chances down into the single digits. If you want to see how the season plays out, it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. Good. doesn't feel like a vote of confidence to me, not with their playoff hopes on life support. It's just a reminder, in my opinion, how badly the Falcons bungled this quarterback situation quarterback, the, the biggest culprit, not, not that this is a perfect team, but quarterback, the biggest culprit in the Falcons problems this season, turnovers have been an issue for Desmond Ritter, Taylor Heineke to this point, hasn't been able to do a whole lot better. We'll see if he can, there's time for Arthur Smith to salvage this thing, but if it doesn't look a hell of a lot better over the last three weeks, I wonder if Arthur blank makes a change there. All right, quarterback news, not the same kind. Let's let's hit on some quarterback injuries. The Houston Texans say C.J. Stroud looks unlikely to play this weekend against the Cleveland Browns. Stroud is still in concussion protocol. He exited that loss to the New York Jets about 10 days ago. It, I mean, of course, it, it especially sucks because you want to see the great quarterbacks play, but you figure given the extra week because the Texans beat Tennessee last week, you think with the extra week, Stroud might be available course no two concussions are the same no two head injuries are the same if he's not ready he's not ready but i bet on sunday afternoon cleveland co- or excuse me houston coaches houston executives thought they had a good shot to get cj stroud back for this game doesn't look likely right now be sure to keep an eye on that it's a bummer it's i mean obviously the playoff in- implications for houston are big big time they've already they're already dealing with injuries in their receiver core having cj available for this would be huge case keenum did manage to lead them to a win against the titans so maybe he can hold the rope one last time give stroud another week to try to come back for the last two weeks but the browns defense is a little bit of a step up in competition we'll see how it goes we'll keep an eye on cj's status Same thing in the AFC South. The Jacksonville Jaguars are practicing, anticipating the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this weekend. Trevor Lawrence remains in concussion protocol. He's also dealing with that ankle injury he suffered against Cincinnati a couple weeks ago. So it's early in the week. We're recording this on Wednesday for full disclosure. Plenty of time for Trevor to to get right, to, to get out of concussion protocol, to be available. But as we move toward the back half of the week, not looking great for either of those AFC South quarterbacks in the AFC North. One last headline to get to that would be Mike Tomlin spending a hefty chunk of his Wednesday talking about Pittsburgh receiver, George Pickens. And these are the types of stories you get when you've lost three games in a row and all of them have happened in ugly fashion. If you're not caught up on it, 
George Pickens drawing severe backlash in Pittsburgh for the perceived lack of effort on a downfield block for Jer- uh, Jalen Warren in that in that loss to Indianapolis over the weekend. Jalen Warren moving toward the end zone, getting pretty far downfield. And you can see George Pickens just sort of standing in front of a potential block, standing in front of a DB who winds up helping to make the tackle on Jalen Warren. George Pickens comes out this week and says, I didn't want to get rolled up on. I didn't want to get hit in the back of my knees, get injured. He noted that it's what happened to Houston receiver tank Dell this season. It's an easy way to get hurt. He's trying to avoid injury. And he points out that he's being singled out by the media, people criticizing him. Again, these are the types of things that happen when you've lost three straight games. I thought it was interesting though. And, and for the record, I, I don't buy what George Pickens is selling. A, there are ways to safely block downfield. And B, that's part of the job description. Ask Kyle Shanahan about receivers blocking downfield, what a difference it can make for your running game. Mike Tomlin spoke about it Wednesday with Pittsburgh Media. He said he'd like for Pickens to be more professional in terms of discussing his shortcomings with you guys, meaning the media. That's a hell of a statement from one of the most accomplished coaches in the NFL, in my opinion, basically saying, A, be more professional in your approach about this, in the things you say publicly, and B, call it a shortcoming. Yes, not quite doing what you're supposed to 100%. And another quote that stands out to me, Mike Tomlin pointing out that, you know, when it rains, it pours. When you're losing three games, these are the types of things that happen. He says, quote, when you're not doing your job and losing, better keep your damn mouth shut and understand that this attracts a certain type of attention as well. And usually that's vulture like attention. Now, I don't love being compared to a vulture by Mike Tomlin, but I get his point. When things are going bad for a team like for any team, but especially a team with the brand name of the Pittsburgh Steelers, negativity draws people in controversy, people criticizing a young player. Like I said, don't love the vulture thing, but I get it. Like if everything was rosy in Pittsburgh, I wouldn't be talking about George Pickens right now and neither would anybody else. So I think he makes a fantastic point that look, is, is going to be bad when you go through the downs and more often than not, every team in the league is going to experience them at some point in the season. Even San Francisco had a three game losing streak at one point in time. This stuff happens, how you approach it, how you handle it is going to be just as big as what happens on the field. And on top of that, George Pickens, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe don't be so defensive about, about such an obvious situation there. Look, I know there's injury avoiding injury and injury itself is a huge part of this thing. Uh, but a situation that could probably be avoided with, with just a little bit more at the end of the play. But on top of that, handling everything else after that is just as big of a part of it. I think some of the blowback for the record is a little out of control. I mean, George Pickens is an insanely talented guy. He's a young guy. He's been in one of the worst passing attacks in the NFL this season. I wouldn't want to give up on that because of the frustrations of your second season in the NFL. I think this is a learning experience. I think Mike Tomlin is as good as anyone at helping young players overcome these sorts of things at helping guys mature into professional football players. I'm not giving up on a talent like George Pickens because he was a bad blocker for a play in what's looking like a lost season, but Hopefully a big time learning experience for George Pickens moving forward. All right, let's get to tonight. Thursday night football right here in Los Angeles, a pair of seven and seven teams squaring off at SoFi stadium. It's the new Orleans saints and the LA Rams. Honestly, the records might not look inspiring, but plenty on the line heading into Christmas weekend. And let's start with the saints. I'm not going to say we owe anybody an apology because the NFC South is definitely bad. But for all the jokes we make about that division, it's technically possible right now that the NFC South puts two teams into the playoffs. It's too early to know for sure, but the Saints beat the Giants last week and the Bucks crushed the Green Bay Packers. They're both seven and seven. They are both mathematically very much alive for both the division title and a wild card. So there's, there's a lot going on there. The Saints currently sit ninth in the NFC just outside of the playoffs, but with the right results and obviously with a win against the LA Rams, the saints aren't just alive for the division title. Even if that doesn't work out for them, they are alive as a wild card team. It just goes to show how watered down the middle of the NFC is 
it's not even a guarantee that a team with a winning record gets in. We could have a below 500 team with the right results. I doubt that'll happen, but it, but it is mathematically possible. This is the third time this season. The saints are coming off back-to-back wins. They beat Carolina and they beat New York. I wouldn't call either win inspiring, but kind of lopsided about as well as the saints have performed here this season. They've never pulled off a three game winning streak at any point this year. And their only win against what you would call a good team came against the Indianapolis Colts all the way back in week eight. So going on the road to get their third street, third straight win and beating a Rams team that is currently in the playoff field. It would be the high point of their season. There's no underselling that that's just facts. It had also bumped their playoff hopes as high as 75%. Like I said, a lot on the line for the new Orleans saints. The needle feels slightly harder to thread for the LA Rams. They're stuck going the wild card route. Obviously the San Francisco 49ers have already won the division. There's no division title on the line here. You're simply playing for one of the wild card spots. Obviously the runner up of the NFC East is a lock to get one of those. So there's just two spots left. That's where the Rams have to wind up. That's what they're playing for. Saints have a little bit more maneuverability for the Rams. It looks bleak if you lose this game. Playoff help hopes alive and well with a win. But if they lose, the New York Times gives the Rams just a 9% chance of making the playoffs. So not mathematically, but realistically, the loser of this game has a much rougher shot at making the postseason, And especially if it's the Rams, like we said, if it's the saints that lose this, you still have the NFC South division race to fall back on Rams really can't afford it in any sort of realistic way. The matchup that I am watching, and I think this will be really, really quality football nerd stuff. I'm looking at the Saints secondary going against the LA Rams receiver core. And the funny thing is Marshawn Lattimore has been out injured for a good little bit right now. The Rams are trying to get, or excuse me, the saints are trying to get him back to practice, but as of yet, he's not there. And the saints are quietly still having a fantastic season in their secondary. They haven't allowed a 300 yard passer all year. They rank sixth in the league in average pass defense, just 185 passing yards allowed per week. They lead the NFL in pass breakups with 87 on the year. That's led by cornerback Paulson Adebo. They're also tied for fifth in the NFL with 14 interceptions. Although they haven't managed an interception in almost a month. They picked off Desmond Ritter. Remember our friend from the Falcons picked him him off twice back on November 26th. Haven't gotten one since I'm sure they would love to boost that number. And theoretically they should have a good shot at it. I'm not saying Matthew Stafford is careless with the football because he's not, He's only throwing interceptions 2% of the time this season, but he puts the ball in the air as much as anyone in the NFL. He averages just South of 35 attempts per game. That's easily in the top 10 of quarterbacks that throw the ball the most often the Rams. Of course, they like to air it out. They have these great receivers. They have a veteran quarterback in Stafford Cooper cup and Puka Nakua Saints secondary is going to have their hands full. And Oh, by the way, Tutu Atwell coming back from a concussion. He has no injury designation for this game. So not a volume guy, but a speedster an explosive play threat between those three. I'd say the Saints secondary is going to be hard pressed to keep their, their success in the passing game intact coming out of this one. It's a strength on strength matchup. It's what these teams do the best. I can't wait to see the chess match of Sean McVay going against Dennis Allen and this Saints secondary. Of course, the Rams ace in the hole is that as fun as Stafford in this passing game have been, they haven't really had to lean on him in the last month or so. Kyron Williams has been back for about a month. He came back from injury on November 26th, and the Rams have been amazing on the ground ever since. Over the last four or five games, they're averaging 168 rushing yards per outing. Kyron Williams having a phenomenal second half of this season. He's only played in 10 games, but he's going to go over a thousand yards. He's at 953. So knock on some wood, preventing injuries. Tyron Williams is, is one or two nice days at the office away from being the Rams first thousand yard back since Todd Gurley in 2018. So yes, for the record, Matthew Stafford, 
having such a fun season. I'm positive he's not getting the credit that he deserves. This is one of the most fun passing attacks in the league. He is playing with incredible confidence. Some of the throws he's willing to make into some of the coverage that he's seeing and Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua rewarding him for it. It's incredibly fun. If you haven't watched a lot of Rams football this year, I really hope you tune in tonight and and get a look at, at what it can look like. But the reason I'm picking the Rams to win this game is because they're the more balanced team. They can fall back on this running game, which has been fantastic. And in addition to that, the Saints defense hasn't done well with it this year. They're 24th in the league in rush defense. Three of their last four opponents have hit them for 140 more excuse me, 140 or more rushing yards. And I think two of those have gone over 200 as a team. So rush defense has been a problem for the saints all year. And as good as their secondary might be, the Rams are equipped to take advantage of that as well. On top of that saints offense, I just don't know what to do with you on a week to week basis. Derek Carr having an incredibly frustrating season. Although the saints get Chris Olave back for this game, maybe that can help their passing attack still. SoFi Stadium. I'm sure the Houdat Nation will be represented here in LA, but it's a home game for the Rams. It's a short week. I'll take the home team with the more balanced attack. I think the Rams get out of here above 500 and boost those wild card odds. All right, before we get out of here, we're going to try to instill some holiday spirit here in the NFL on Fox Podcast. Christmas is right around the corner. We got the games to get to on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So, in the spirit of the holiday, I'm going to do something we're calling the naughty and nice list. I don't know if I can make your, your Christmas wish list come true, but I can tell you mine. I can tell you who I think is getting some presents and some coal in their stocking this Christmas. If you're watching, I hope you see my festive hat, but yeah, got a lot of stuff to recap. A lot of, a lot of people that have been good and bad in the NFL this season. We're going to get right into it. We're going to start on the naughty list. Like the people who should be expecting a lump of coal or at the very least, uh, you know, a bummer of an off season to look forward to. So we'll jump right into it with my naughty list. And as I alluded to at the top of the show, I want to, I want to give a lump of coal to the Atlanta Falcons, not just for losing to Carolina, although that is maybe the most embarrassing loss of the 2023 season, losing nine to seven in the rain to your divisional rival, but to squander such a promising season on such an obvious thing, which is the quarterback position. You know, maybe you've heard of it, the most important position in the game of football. The way that the Atlanta Falcons just refused to do anything about it was always weird to me. And I know they had Desmond Ritter, and I know that he was worth getting a look at. That's not the point, but there were so many other things that the Falcons could have done to address this situation other than just signing Taylor Heineke. I mean, for starters, for starters, the Atlanta Falcons said in the off season that they weren't overly interested in pursuing Lamar Jackson. I just want to make sure everybody remembers that that's a real actual story that happened in the NFL this year. Arthur blank saying like, ah, this is a different situation than the Deshaun Watson one. Again, I'm not making any of this up. This all, this all happened. The Atlanta Falcons. No, thank you. Also not interested in Jacoby Brissett. Also not interested in Joe Flacco, who's doing better things in Cleveland right now than anybody in an Atlanta Falcons uniform. This team is a quarterback away from being pretty damn good. And the Atlanta Falcons game plan for the season was, eh, I hope this works. And it's sure as hell looking like they're going to be at home because of it. Just naughty, nasty roster management by the Atlanta Falcons, by Arthur Smith and that organization. Continuing that trend. I wonder if Joe Barry, the Green Bay Packers defensive coordinator, is feeling naughty this year after his defense allowed 800 yards and more to the Giants and the Buccaneers the last two weeks. Packers go from one of the hottest teams in the league to not mathematically out of the playoffs, but but not looking great, guys. Not looking great up there in Green Bay. And their defense is clearly the main culprit in all of it. Matt LaFleur opting not to make a move. And that's, that's completely fine right now with three weeks left in the season, but I can hear the clamoring in green Bay. I can hear the dissatisfaction with that defense. It's hard not to look at Joe Barry as the reason why this very promising season suddenly went sideways. Okay. <laughs> Speaking lumps of coal. How about Kareem Jackson, Denver Broncos safety. 
receiving a, a lump of coal in his stocking for the number of fines he's incurred for big hits. Actually, I don't even have to call it a lump of coal. We'll call it a much lighter wallet than he began the season with. Kareem Jackson has been fined roughly 90,000 for hits during games this season. And then, of course, he was suspended four games because of it. Doing some basic math on his contract, it adds up to roughly $560,000 in pay. Yeah, I'd say that qualifies as naughty. I Like I said, I don't, I don't even need to know if you need to have coal delivered to you when you've been hit for that much in fines, lost that much money because of uh, the NFL telling you to clean up your play. I know he said he's been singled out. He says it's not fair. That doesn't change uh, the the drastic reduction in his pocketbook this season. All right, how about this one? It's been it's been quite a season for Cowboys cornerback Deron Bland. It's the season of giving. Clearly, it's been the season of taking for Deron Bland. That's that's pretty naughty when you think about it, Deron. He leads the league in interceptions with eight of them. He's taken five of them back to the house for touchdowns. That was an NFL record. It's been a few weeks since he got on the ledger, even though we're calling it naughty because he's taken from other people. But I bet you Cowboys fans would say it'd be pretty nice if he could get another one or two of those here for the regular season ends. I alluded to this one, too. Let's wrap up the naughty list with Aaron Rodgers. Attention seeking is is naughty behavior like that's going to land you on the naughty list. And I I feel culpable in it because when a guy of Aaron Rodgers status in the NFL is talking about coming back in the same season that he tore his Achilles, it feels like you have to to give oxygen to it. It feels like it's something worth talking about. But as Aaron Rodgers confirmed himself this week, it was never realistic to think this was going to happen. And though he might say that if the Jets were mathematically eligible for the playoffs, he might have pushed to play. That doesn't sound realistic either. Not for a guy who's on the doorstep of 40. This whole thing was just a, a circus, basically. And it honestly distracted from the fact that this was a pretty damn good Jets team that could have had a much better season if it had done anything to address the injury to Aaron Rodgers. I mentioned it when we were talking about the Falcons just now. Joe Flacco has helped the Browns get to the cusp of the playoffs. I know, ironically, Josh Dobbs is no longer the starter in Minnesota, but he won the Vikings enough games that they are not only still alive, but sitting in a playoff spot right now. This Jets defense was good enough that all it would take was something for them to have a chance. And I don't know if Aaron Rodgers' posturing is why the Jets decided not to do anything. Maybe that's just a different type of malfeasance all its own. But this whole storyline distracted, in my opinion, from the very basic idea that the Jets were were one small move away from being a much more competitive team. And now, just as everybody thought, Aaron Rodgers isn't going to play this year and the Jets aren't going to play in the playoffs for the 13th year in a row. Dumb story, dumb time. I blame myself for being part of making it a story, but hey, that's where we are. All right, let's move over to the nice side of this thing. Let's just some some feel good storylines in the Christmas season that just give me the warm and fuzzies like my favorite Christmas movie. Number one, that's my guy Joe Burrow doing a really nice thing in a bad situation. Obviously, his wrist injury ended his season a while ago. But every time I watch a Bengals game, you know what they show? They show Jake Browning's family sitting in Joe Burrow's suite. I don't have a whole lot of stats for this. It's just, I think it's really heartwarming for the 280, $90 million quarterback to say, Hey, your son, brother, whatever, Jake, he's been in the league for a long damn time waiting for his shot. He's getting it in Cincinnati. How about you come use my suite at Paycor stadium to watch the games? I just think it's really nice. Good on you, Joe. Good on you. Bengals and Jake Browning's family too. Next up on the list. I got CJ Stroud for a being awesome at his job, but also just rejuvenating the Houston Texans. Like I know there are some franchises that have been waiting a lot longer than Houston to be good again, but it's been a brutal four years in Houston. They hadn't won more than four games in the season since 2019. You add into that the saga with Deshaun Watson, all of the allegations, not wanting to play there anymore. Is he going to get traded? He finally gets traded bad football all around you. A, a laughing stock of a front office. And man, if that doesn't feel like ancient history because of a 22 year old kid 
excuse me, not kid. That's patronizing. Uh, CJ Stroud is a young man who is sixth in the league in passing yards, fifth in passer rating, 11th in passing touchdowns. The vibes in Houston, whether they make the playoffs or not, are awesome. And it's a breath of fresh air. You would call it nice. And I'm, I'm just thrilled that CJ Stroud is there to help the Houston Texans turn thing around. I'll stick in the AFC South for a nice job, a job well done by the entire Colts coaching staff. Obviously that's Shane Steichen, but I'm going to use this time holidays to shout out offensive coordinator, Jim Bob Cooter, defensive coordinator, Gus Bradley, special teams coordinator, Brian Mason. The Colts picked fourth in the NFL draft in the spring. That typically means you're a bad football team. That's why you have a new coach. Shane Steichen. Then they lost the guy that they've used that pick on. Anthony Richardson hasn't been in uniform since early October. Jonathan Taylor has been missing for a large chunk of this season. Defense cut Darius Leonard. They're their stalwart for so many years. This is a roster that the average fan doesn't know. Michael Pittman jr. Is a good player. Zach Moss has been great for them. Kenny Moore underrated player that probably doesn't get talked about enough, but by and large, this is not what you would call a playoff team. And here they are firmly in the playoffs, 54% chance to make it. Defense has been solid. Offense has found a way shout out Brian Mason in particular, because the Colts won that goofy ass Titans game a few weeks ago, purely off of two blocked punts. So the whole staff deserves a round of applause. I hope your Christmas bonuses are huge. I hope you get what you want this year, which is probably a playoff berth and the Colts are well on their way to getting it next up on the nice list. I just want to say something nice about Monday night football, because in a season where prime time hasn't always meant good football, there's been a lot of blowouts and a lot of bad games. Let's be honest, but Monday night football has delivered the goods. And I would know as somebody who watches it every week for work, there's been 18 Monday night football games this year. When you include the double headers, 15 of them have been decided by six points or less. That's I mean, basically every week you're tuning in for a photo finish at the end of the game. There have been seven straight upsets. Now after the Seahawks went over Philadelphia, that's a record on Monday night football. And it, I mean, it started a couple nights ago and it goes all the way back. Seahawks Eagles was a banger. The Titans had that epic comeback over the Miami dolphins a couple weeks ago, that ridiculous sequence at the end of Broncos bills, Jake Browning had his coming out party on Monday night football. I could go all the way back to week one when Xavier Gibson returned that punt in overtime to beat the bills in the season opener every week. It's been awesome. Can't take that for granted. Clearly, with some of the other games we've seen this year, it's been a hell of a lot of fun. Thank you, Monday night, for truly delivering on your promise for for just fantastic football. I'll wrap this up. Guy that's near and dear to my heart, Mike McDaniel, for just generally being a breath of fresh air among NFL coaches. A really nice job of being entertaining. As recently as today, he told reporters that he told his team, the Dolphins, to tell reporters to F off respectfully. If they asked about something other than the Cowboys game, if they tried to take the focus somewhere else, he's every week, there's a joke coming out of him trolling people on the sideline, laughing, having fun. He's clearly instilled so much confidence into a tongue of Iloa. He wears off white air force ones and Yeezys. Mike McDaniel is a millennial football coach. And I'm so excited to think that there could be more guys like him coming down the pipe. It's, it's such a change of pace. It's exciting to think that that could be the future of NFL coaching. So I just want to say Mike McDaniel, nice job. That wraps it up for today, but we've got so much more Christmas content coming your way, playing games on Christmas Eve and Christmas day after all, and some good ones too. We'll get into that Cowboys dolphins game. I just mentioned, uh, maybe you've heard that the top seeds in each conference, the Ravens and 49ers are playing each other really quality holiday schedule. We're going to preview the whole thing for you tomorrow until then, please go find us on Spotify. Please go subscribe on Apple podcasts. We have a YouTube channel, wherever you get your NFL news, your podcasts, you can find us there. 
I hope you are enjoying this holiday week and I will be back to talk week 16 with y'all tomorrow. Until then, I'll catch you next time.